Last year, I bought my first Commodore 64 to complete a challenge. Here it is, looking very nice. To complete a challenge that I had set myself after being a bit shit at Ocean Software's classic Whizball. This obviously wasn't my first experience with the bread bin though. Although most of my friends had a ZX Spectrum, the same as me, I did have one friend who lived across the road who had a Commodore 64. He had a proper setup too, with a colour monitor, tape drive, the bread bin, and later on a disk drive all set up on a fancy computer desk in a space between the lounge and dining area. We, me and other curious specky friends, would often go to his house to marvel at this strange beigeness. In the most part, I was pretty jealous to be honest. Some games just blew me away compared to what those games looked like on my home computer. Bubble Bobble looked just like the arcade version for example, and although the Spectrum one played pretty well, it didn't quite hit the same. There were many times I played a game on his Commodore, fell in love with it and hoped to recreate that experience by purchasing it for my Spectrum. Kickstart 2 was such a game. We played that for hours on end, designing courses, racing each other. The nostalgia for that game is off the chart. The Spectrum version? Yeah, not so much. A bit of a clunky mess with horrible mechanics that made staying on the bike about as hard as eating muesli through a straw. This wasn't always the case though, and there were many instances where I was perfectly happy with my Spectrum version. Also, because it was often copied from a mate, it was a damn sight cheaper too, whereas the circle of available friends to copy games from was considerably smaller for my Commodore friend. There were odd occasions though when a game came along that looked supremely awesome on the C64, but to my shock and horror was not available on the ZX Spectrum. In those instances, I just had to admit defeat and marvel at their 64K goodness. Some of these games came on discs though, which weren't as popular in the UK as tape drives, largely down to the cost I suppose. The disc drives cost just as much as the computer until prices dropped towards the later part of the 80s. So if you had a mate with a disc drive as well, they had plenty of ammunition to shoot you down. And these games definitely made this Spectrum owner cry until my dad bought home an IBM compatible from his work, but that's a story for another day. Now, the countdown on the best of these games will commence shortly after a small terms and condition point is raised. Firstly, this is my list of games, but please tell me yours because the comments are the best bit to all this. But number two, don't shout at me if I've missed something glaring obvious to you, okay? RPG fans, I'm keeping my eye on you. Simply to qualify, the game did not get released for the Spectrum for whatever reason. And there are some interesting reasons and caveats here. This list is a mix of games that I definitely lusted after back in the day. And some are ones that I found more recently were looking for more interesting titles to play on my newly acquired C64. C. Because C is cooler. Oh, and I've also thrown in some specky equivalents as well to keep you Spectrum folk happy. Number 10, Parallax. I've always enjoyed a decent top-down shooter, but give me a top-down shooter with a twist like Firefly on the Spectrum here, and I'm sold. I will buy all the things. Well, now I would, but back then I would, depending on how much paper round money I had. Parallax is very much in that category of game. A sensible software game published by Ocean and produced by the same chaps who bought us the classic Whizball a year later. From the very opening drug-induced intro to Martin Galway's excellent soundtrack, this game is a real treat. One of those ridiculously overcomplicated backstories that hide a fairly simple game. You start off in a landed spacecraft called the Ibis. Once you've mastered the sometimes fiddly controls, you can zoom around and blast alien ships and turrets to your heart's content. You're on the lookout for bunkers and a place to land though, as these contain computers that can provide you with the password to get out of the zone or items you can purchase to keep you and your ship healthy. Scientists can be stunned with your guns. You can grab different level key cards to obtain different letters of the password. This is all done with a stunning backdrop of music and sound with some very fast scrolling and gameplay. It can be awkward at times landing your ship or manoeuvring around large objects. Never been a huge fan of height depth in games. But these are minor quibbles. 
Zap agreed that the blend was a good one and gave the game an impressive 93%. Number 9. Scarabaeus 3D maze games were in plentiful supply on the spectrum, but none of them managed to take the crown and become the king of maze games from J.K. Gray's 16K 3D Monster Maze for the ZX81. The text telling you footsteps were approaching created the tension and the game moved at a fairly good pace. It was certainly good enough to make me jump on more than one occasion playing it when I was younger. So enter Scarabaeus, apologies if I'm saying that wrong, for the Commodore 64 to see what the competition could achieve some four years later with a considerably high amount of memory and hardware on offer. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, this game is running on a C64. Just look at it. Zipping about in a truly slick manner, the first level is fairly simple. You need to catch the ghosts in order to get the hieroglyphics needed to move on to the next level. I managed this, but then even after reading the instructions I got super confused by the next level, but I was impressed with how the gameplay shifted. The atmospheric music, which can actually be turned off leaving you breathing in a spacesuit, add to the tension when nasties appear. And I honestly got a little scared the first time a spider jumped out on me. Only three levels apparently, but there is enough here to keep you occupied for hours. A Hungarian game published by Areola Soft, which still makes me chuckle like a 10 year old. This was available on tape and disc in 1985 and was also highly regarded by most of the magazines at the time, gaining an admirable 96% in Zap magazine. Number 8. Slicks Almost breaking my own rules with this one, but I'll explain why I let it in. Top-down racers, like top-down shooters, have always appealed to me. From the first time I spanned the steering wheel like a madman in the arcade playing Super Sprint, to replicating that experience as best as I could on my humble spectrum. I've always enjoyed a top-down racer. Some budget offerings served me very well too, like BMX Simulator here. And then I found Slicks. A recent find this one and instantly I was attracted to the cute 8-bit graphics. With a good use of the C64's colour palette and a nice little twist on playing just a regular racer. You start off in a crap car, but at the start of each Grand Prix you can challenge any of the other cars. If you beat them you get their seat and improve the car that you race with. Lose and you stay where you are unless you are stupid enough to challenge a car lower than you and lose. Yep, I did that. It makes the races super fun as you try and improve as you go. You get to keep the car you end up in at the end of the Grand Prix for the next go also. Now, I've seen a lot of people complain that this is hard to progress past fourth place, but I'm not there yet, so can't specifically comment on that. But this is one of Codemasters budget releases right towards the end of the C64's life and the Spectrums for that matter. So why wasn't it ported? Well, it kind of was. It appears that Codemasters didn't release it on its own for the Spectrum at the time. Maybe not commercially viable, who knows, as the Spectrum really was on its arse come 1993. But they did bundle it in a compilation of games called Super Sport Challenge. Here you can see the only screenshot of the game I could find, right underneath our Scylla. The game appears to be lost. You can't download it anywhere. The main Spectrum sites won't publish Codemaster games anyways, but the more reliable of the dodgy ones don't have it either. I searched high and low and nada, nothing, zip. It doesn't exist. So this version seems to be the only one you can play today. But what a version it is, ticking all the boxes for me.
Number seven, alter ego. An adventure game, simulation, role player perhaps? I'm not entirely sure what genre you put this down as, and that's why this game still intrigues people today. Released by Activision in 1986, I first came across this game when I had access to my first IBM compatible PC some years after its release. I had no idea at the time that this was available on the Commodore 64, although it comes on three discs only. No tapes here I'm afraid, and certainly amongst the people I knew who owned a C64, tape was very much king here in the UK. At $19.99 on release, it's not a cheap game to purchase, close to 60 quid nowadays, but oh boy. 12 year old me would have loved getting hold of this. Graphically there's not much to look at but that's not the point. At the beginning of the game you are asked to select one of the seven stages of life to start from, number one obviously being infancy. You are then set a number of questions that determine certain factors and decisions and reactions your character has throughout their life. As you progress through infancy you challenge yourself to simple things. Are you a chilled happy child or do you cry at the earliest opportunity? As you get older and move through the game, more icons appear, anything from loans, to your health, to how your marriage is going. It's so absorbing to play, whether you're trying to create a psychopath or just playing true to yourself to see how your life maps out. Either way, it keeps you thoroughly entertained. Being over three discs, the scenarios do eventually repeat, but there is enough variations to keep this unique enough for multiple plays. Zap Magazine definitely agreed. There are two versions of the game, male and female, so I'm intrigued after giving the male version a few goes to see how much the female version differs. I really can't think of a Spectrum equivalent to this. Sure, there was quite a few crappy text-driven basic psychological programs that promised to help find your career path and so on, a bit like this one here, but nothing anywhere near as in-depth as Alter Ego. Number six, the Great Gianna Sisters. Well, well, I think Commodore Usher should start this one. The last great old arcade classic still to appear in any shape or form in the home computer market is Super Mario Brothers. Anyone who wanted a classic taste of this ingenious platform game had to go out and buy a Nintendo console. And who wants one of them? You couldn't even find a clone for heaven's sake. Until now, that is. Behind the tongue-in-cheek title of Rainbow Art's latest game is a highly playable Super Mario replica. And yes, it couldn't be more of a Super Mario rip-off if it tried. And try it did, much to the displeasure of Nintendo, who incredibly saw all the similarities and politely requested Rainbow Arts to withdraw the game. No lawsuit actually happened from what I can see, but the game was withdrawn. The withdrawal came after the Commodore 60 version was out in the wild though, which is why you can play it today. Try and play the Spectrum version though, and yeah, good luck with that. These magazine screenshots are all that exist unfortunately, so for any Super Mario ripoff fun without actually owning a NES, SNES etc, this was your only chance. So immediately of course, I was jealous. I wanted it because I couldn't have it. But how similar is it really? Well, you can see here it's actually taking the royal piss. From the colour of the black ground to the stair jump at the end of the level, to level 2 being underground, it all just made me smile. It's pretty damn playable too once you get used to the weird jump mechanic. Graphically pretty decent, plays well, sounds good. What's not to love? Well, this loading screen for one. I mean, what the f*** is going on with her head? Number five, Project Firestart. On the spectrum, if you wanted to soil your corduroys whilst playing computer games, you would probably play Aliens. Watching your team getting picked off while you scan the corridors was utterly terrifying as a kid. 
On the Commodore, they had a multiple choice of poo splattering games, one of which turns up in our chart here, Project Firestart. While it lacks much in the way of sound, the cutscenes and general eeriness of the empty corridors would have shipped me up no end back in the day. When you open a door to a couple of green guys on the other side, it's enough to start a panic attack, even now. The sprite animation, although a bit framey, would have impressed me back then. It's a lovely game to look at, but can sometimes just feel like a maze game upon playing it. I would have been pretty jealous of this back in the day for sure. 91% from Zap ain't half bad either, and they also seem to enjoy the brown trouser elements on offer here. Number 4. Paradroid Now, another controversial entry here, but hear me out. Yes, us lucky Spectrum folk got the rather excellent Quasitron, and nothing against that game, but I was never a fan of its isometric viewpoint. I did play Paradroid first, to be fair, and was blown away by how fast it moved and scrolled at the time. You start as a basic droid and the premise is to simply destroy all the other droids on a given level before moving on to the next one. Each droid you face has a unique number, the higher the number the more powerful the droid. You can try to transfer to a droid by battling it in a mini game of securing the most amount of your coloured cables. If you win you get the better weaponry of the droid you defeated, making destroying other droids an easier process. I love the simple idea that is implemented so very well, and that goes for both games I suppose. Magazines loved it back then too, getting a massive 97% in Zap Magazine. I'm not sure why Houston didn't port the game as is to the Spectrum and decided to go for the isometric view and renaming it as they've made quite a few changes to the features. Maybe it was a better fit for the Spectrum's scrolling capabilities, I'm not sure. But on discovering that Quasitron had the same premise as Paradroid, I was a little disappointed it wasn't a like for like copy. Number 3. Space Rogue. Well now, this game, stretching our little beige friend to the max. Even the title screen struggles. It would be easy to describe this as uh, an elite upgrade, but I think that takes something away from this game. A great intro sequence sets up a story of you flying around in space in some shipfest spacecraft looking just to survive. With disc loading times that can be laborious now if you're playing it as it would have been played back then, but big space stations, with easy docking I might add, and the ability to leave your spacecraft and wander around in a top down view, try that in Elite. I would have immersed myself in this for hours if I ever had this on my home computer. It certainly would have felt like a big step up from Elite with the extras on offer. A true classic that really belonged on the 16 bits, but the C64 showed it could still move polygons about. Zap Magazine agreed, giving the game a whopping 97%. Number 2. Pirates Now I had to put Pirates or Sid Meier's Pirates in because this was a game I was insanely jealous of back in 1986. Playing it now, yeah, yeah, not so much. It's a bit clunky and generally feels a bit unresponsive, but it's one of those that you've really got to remember how you felt about it back in the day. Sailing the seas, sinking ships, fighting captains, exploring islands, attacking anything that moves, it really did feel like an open world which I guess was the whole point. 
Interestingly, although considered very much a classic on the C64, Zap Magazine didn't like it. They only gave it 68%. And also, Pirates was supposed to be ported to the Spectrum too, but never materialised. So, what pirate games come close on the Spectrum? Well, none that I can remember. Although I did sink hours into the wonderful budget title Booty. But yeah, Sid Meier's Pirates it ain't. Number one, Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders and Maniac Mansion. So, two games share the top spot, and before you throw something at the TV whilst informing me that Zack McCracken is better than Maniac Mansion, or the other way round, well, I have an admission to make. I had never played Zack McCracken until yesterday. Maniac Mansion? Absolutely. All of the Monkey Islands and Indiana Joneses? 100%. Even your day of the tentacles and Sam and Max's multiple times. But poor old Zack passed me by. I've no idea why because I adored these games. I came to Maniac Mansion a little late when I acquired the use of a 386 PC some years after its release. But man what a game. The puzzles, the humour, the depth, the hours spent trying to work out the often brilliantly ridiculous puzzles that often had you shouting at frustration until you work it out and then hate yourself for missing something so blimmin' obvious. Now either you love these point and click adventures or hate them, but to have the chance to play them on your Commodore 64 is flipping awesome. Okay, you needed a disk drive, and yes there is some disk squapping to be had, but what I always assumed was a 16-bit era game popping up here makes me love the Commodore 64 a little bit more. So which one is best? Well, not for me to say, but looking on sites like Lemon64, it appears Zap wins the day for users of that site. Zap Magazine gave both games 93% though, so maybe we'll go for that and call it an honourable draw. As for the Specky? Ah, uh, well, we had Grange Hill in 1987. Now surely that's a winner. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.